Hi, this is Hannah for the Manchester Culture Show, and I'm interviewing Alex from Mama Freedom. So you guys have been described as like watching a storm flatten a building with anger and fury one minute, then seeing the sun break through the next, morphing from chaotic to calm in the beat of a drum. A lethal combination of heavy, moody, hard-driven, beat-laden funk rock, hip-hop and soaring, warming, uplifting soul with raunchy blues. This is quite a powerful and rich description of your music. How would you describe your sound to those who are new to hearing about Mama Freedom? I'll describe the sound as a cinematic funk, or which is a good one, which I quite like. Um, symphonic funk is a good one, <clears throat> excuse me, which I quite like. Uh, the best one I've heard so far was Psychedelic Beethoven. That was my favourite out of them all. Um, but it's a combination of, of little bits of funk, little bits of soul, little bits of hip-hop, little bits of rock infused in our own um, in our own brand. Uh, you know, it's very orchestral because of the, you know, film score influence, uh, the John Barry, Lalo Schifrin influence, and, uh, of course, Beethoven and Chopin and those types of, uh, of influences. But... It is a big amalgamation, but it's very symph- it's very cinematic. It's very symphonic uh, with the orchestras, but it is also quite funky for you know in the basics of a backbeat and bass lines and things like that. So yeah, amalgamation. That I'd go with a psychedelic Beethoven if anybody um, really wanted to push me to it, because I think that even though I wouldn't dream of comparing myself or the band to Beethoven, because um, he's such a master and a, and a genius of his art. Uh, I, I quite like that one. It was a really good description. It was a um, it was a, a nice way of doing it. So I'd go with that one. There are eight of you in the band, bringing a plethora of musical and production talent to the stage. So how did you guys all get together and start making music? We all got together via different ways. We've all known each other for for a long time, um, on and off. You know, in 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 music, in personal. Obviously, me and Jay are brothers. So so that was the first thing. Um, I met Gaz uh, when I was doing my first ever job as an 18-year-old and he was in the same place I was and we decided we'd get together. Uh, Digger we've known ever since we were kids, we've been to the same school, Jane and went to the same college um, and he was the natural guitarist to, to come in. Uh, he was friends with Dickie, um, who I then met, who we brought in. Um, Bob came then uh, originally as just to... Like we wanted a trumpet player, we wanted a brass section for the sound, and um, and Bob came in and ended up staying. And AJ, strangely enough, came up to us at the end of a gig um, when we had Bruce, who actually moved to South Korea. Um, and it, before we knew that, AJ came to us and asked, "Did we want a sax player?" Um, and at the time, we said, "No, but we'll take your number." And then three weeks later, Bruce announced he was going to South Korea. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. That all happens. I don't advertise for anybody. I've never advertised for people because when you find out that those people don't fit with what you are and what you do, people just find us. Um, people just come to us and, and we seem to find each other. And, and if musical souls are supposed to meet and the cosmos is aligned, um, then we will. Same with Dan, uh, who, who is uh, who's the youngest out of them all. He, he came through a friend of a friend and um, ended up liking being having the same favourite band as, as two or three of the lads in the band as well. So that was nice because the influences were all the same. Um, so, yeah, we've all kind of known each other on and off. I just decided that I wanted to find my best friends who were also the best players at what they did and try and see if we could um, get together. I sold them this dream of having a studio and a band and writing for other people and now doing film music and, uh, and all this kind of stuff. And this was... 10 years ago, 12, some of, some of them longer than that. And, and now we've got all those things. So, um, it, you know, it was a nice tip for me that I've actually kind of managed to get them where I we told them we were trying to go. So we've still got a long way to go yet. You know, I mean, we're only at about 2% of where I'd like to be or, or what I'd like to know by the end of my career. So it's quite fun still that we're only at that, um, at that stage. You were signed to In Touch Records and managed by Charles Collini of the Collini Group, both in New York, whose artists include world-famous Oscar-winning composer Ennio Morricone and Keith Emerson. What was that like getting signed, and how did it come about? It wasn't very... People think signing a record deal is going to be some major life-changing um, thing, but it isn't really. It came about from the internet of all places. Uh, we had um, Larry who's a very one of my bestest friends in, in LA who is a film producer but also ran 
who still runs part of my company in LA. He was uh, pushing the band around to different people, and Charles, who is uh, Tito Puente's stepson, um, who's also managing uh, agent for Ennio Morricone and George Benson and people like that, and hangs around and rubs shoulders with some very, very big people. Um, he just came in and, and took us, and we signed to the label, and um, and really then I think you're under pressure to, to make sure you've got the product. I mean, you can go around saying for as long as you want that you've got a product and you think it's the best thing that there is and uh, or what for you I mean and uh, you know you can tell each other that you've got something great but then to actually go and prove it by putting it out and touring with it and promoting it doing the radio and things like that then you know that's all part of it but it didn't really change anything it just made you want to work a bit harder really I think that's the best way of describing it you have to prove why you're there then you know I think anyway I think what most people think once you've got the record do you sit back and relax and and, uh, and you know tra travel the world but you don't you have to work twice as hard because you have to keep your deal once you've got it um so i, I think that would be the you know that would be the best piece of advice for anybody starting out with a record deal make sure you keep it you released your debut album on the first of march which is preachers and criminals and it's been highly praised both here in the uk and the us it must have been a proud moment to have the debut released Tell us more about the album, as this not only covers your own original material, but some perfectly executed covers too. Uh, no, there's only one cover on it, <clears throat> um, which is No Diggity, uh, which we decided to put on because of we were doing a lot of shows at the time. We were doing a lot of funk nights, club nights, where we didn't have support bands, because logistically for an eight-piece band to do an hour, you really don't want to have three bands on before messing up the sound and things like that. And that's not their fault because they need a sound too. You know, it's only fair that they have one. And we didn't think it's right to take time away from support bands to, for our own sound. So we ended up just doing it on our own. And when you're in that scenario, there's people there who um, don't know your sound and don't know what you're doing and who you are. So you have to kind of warm them up a little bit. And we just decided to throw a few covers in the live show and Diggity was one that stuck because uh, I'd loved it as being a kid. It was the first time, you know, um, I love LA, I love the California sound anyway, so that was the hip-hop fused with a bit of R&B and it was the first time I'd kind of got into hip-hop as a kid, so um, that was something. And Jay sang it in rehearsals and we were like, you know, that done, let's just do it. We recorded it as a live version for a B-side um, in the studio playing live together. And then I decided just to record it properly, just to make it an album version. And um, I just decided it had to go, really. It was one of those. It had to go on there. But um, it is, was a proud moment. It was very surreal. Because um, you spend 10 years making your first album and three months making your second one, you know, that's because you've already got your deal and it's out. And you've been waiting all this time to get your stuff out. And it was very proud. Um, but... I mean, with all of the songs written, you know, for the album, it's kind of a concept, Preachers and Criminals. It's the dark and the light. It's the up and the down. It's the it's the opposites of everything. I mean, the music even itself, with like the, you mentioned at the beginning there, with, um, you know, morphs from chaotic to calm in the beat of a drum, which it does, you know. It, 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 it flicks from one to the other. We bring you up and down. We never leave you sat too still for, for you know, too length amount of time before we hit you with something a little different to what you've been hearing before. So... There's a quite a, a mixture of it, but she is quite... It's not a concept on, but she's very much written within the same kind of um, uh, vein and the same kind of idea and the same kind of theme, uh, which she preaches and criminals, which is the opposites of the... Uh, which is the opposites of it all. Um, you have to decide what you are, if you're a preacher or a criminal. You have to pick a side, I think. That's, <laughs> that was the... Uh, that was the way we'd, I thought of it when we were... Uh, when, we, when I originally chose the name. Uh... So yeah, that that's uh, that probably just about covers that for um, for songs. Um, and a lot of the songs were written have been written for many years. Some of them were quite not re as recent as four years ago. That's uh, the other stuff we've been writing recently is for the next two albums, which are coming next year. So um, you have to wait for those to see what comes with. What are your personal album highlights? If my personal highlights, finishing the album was I think was the first one. Um, uh, oh God, it's hard to ask favourites. That's like asking what's your favourite child. Um, each one of them does does different things for different reasons. There's little parts of each of the songs um, in each part of the song that are different to the other uh, to the other song uh, to the other parts of the song, and 
there's a reason for that, but that's between me and the band, and, and uh, that's a personal thing to us, so I can't really divulge too much about that. But, um, yeah, personal highlights, I don't know, it's tough on that. I'd, I'd probably, finishing it, definitely, that's the first one. Uh, seeing it on, on, you know, for sale, definitely. Seeing the cover, when the first time I saw the cover was great. Um, you know, picking picking the name out, album name is great, even though we've had that for four or five years, that was really good too. Um, but I think, I don't know, the end of Weasel probably is, is a Weasel, the last track has always been sort of Daddy's Little Girl in terms of um, she was the first one on the album to be written. And, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on creating the sound and the, the textures and the timbres of each each song and each instrument and the instrumentation and the arrangement. So Weasel kind of sums up um, the album quite perfectly, especially the ending when all the lads are singing and it's we're saying kind of saying goodbye. Uh, but Preacher Man being the centrepiece of the album, that is quite um, quite personal to me as well. Uh, as is Prejudice, which is which is quite a powerful lyric from Jay about about prejudice uh, and and things that are still around in the world today. Uh, and Belong as well, which is the slower one of the slower ones. That that um, to just be able to get that exactly how I heard it originally when Jay brought me the original acoustic demo to get that like that was was a really big um, was a big deal for me as well. So, uh, yeah, so those, um, but really it is like asking me my favourite child. Being signed to a New York label, you guys have also been based across the pond for quite a period of time, and your rich film score-like sound has certainly caught the attention of Hollywood. So, any film scores being discussed? Uh, yes, there are film scores being discussed at the moment. I can't divulge too much information um, because they only are at early stages, but one of the uh, films that we will hopefully be involved in is a film called Cottonwood starring Willie Nelson um, which is a based on the book Cottonwood from Stacey Campbell Stacey Dean Campbell uh, and they've written a screenplay for it and they've got everybody on board and they're looking at financing at the moment and I am in talks to do the score for that as well as a possible NASCAR film with uh, allegedly starring George Clooney. But the thing about the film business in LA is everything's a supposed alleged. Until you've got it down in front of you, I, I don't really pay much attention to it. Um, I leave Lawrence to get on, or Charles to get on with discussing the film scores and things until somebody says to me, we want 10 pieces of music, 20 pieces of music. By that time, for those cues, uh, then I don't really think too much about it. But Cottonwood is, is the closest one at the moment. So probably a little premature with the new album out this year, but I can imagine you guys have a whole catalogue of material to impress audiences with. Any hint on future musical plans? Yes, we have our whole musical plan um, worked out like a Marvel strategy. I, I'm a very big uh, Marvel fan, a very big Iron Man fan particularly, so I pinched their idea of the phases. Um, so phase one of CMI Music Group was to release the Man of Freedom album, Preachers Criminals, Jay has a solo album, The Man with Freedom Singer, Jay, my brother, has a solo album out in August. Then we have a hip-hop project, uh, a, a sort of a, a, a US-Canadian-UK uh, collective that, I, that I'm that i the head of. Uh, that's called The Sonic Generals. That's a hip-hop album, very old-school hip-hop, very purist old-school hip-hop. Uh, that will be out in uh, December. And then I can reveal, as we did at the show the other night, that the second album will be a double album. Um, it will be called The Voodoo Street Sessions 1 and 2, and will hopefully be available in August, as will Jay's second album, which will be... Uh, sorry, April next year. Jay's second album will be August next year, and the second Sonic Generals project will, again, probably be December next year. So we've got plenty of musical plans. I'm working with a few younger artists. I am working with a few million-selling artists and a few number-one artists at the moment. Uh, but that's again, I'll, I'll keep that my counsel on that a little bit until more of that has um, more of that has finished. I have had 